<coughs> Hello again, folks. Um, today we're going to be doing, or well, starting, uh, chapter nine. Let me get my big head out of the way. Uh, chapter nine, which is uh, trig equations and um, identities. I kind of jumped the gun last time when I was with you, and I kind of, I sort of spoiled the surprises, you might say. Uh, I mentioned the Pythagorean identity. Um, not that it was wrong to do that. I mean, as is often the case in math, you can do things more than one way, but it's really the subject for today, the identities, some of which you already have anyhow. Um, anyhow, there's a handout, as there always is, right, uh, that will be available to you in Canvas, and it looks like this. All right? um, it's, ac it's actually going to be two pages, but... Um, this is the first one, and this is what's really relevant for uh, section 9.1. Right? The trig identities, uh, these you know, co-functions, co right? uh, which is just to say that sine and cosine are off by 90 degrees. These reciprocal identities you also already know. You know that sine and cosecant are reciprocals of one another. Because if you examine their ratios, um, opposite of a hypotenuse, the, the, that's the sign, the, the cosecant would be that uh, flipped upside down, right? And similarly, this is just another way of writing that. Uh, similarly, there's cosine and secant, tangent and cotangent, and so forth and so on. These two, all right, are um, the quotient identities, all right, which is just a very convenient way of writing tangent. Instead of writing it as tangent, you could write it as the, the ratio of sine to cosine. And similarly, cotangent could be the ratio of cosine to sine. If you, again, you use the, the sort of fraction-esque form of what the trig functions represent, their ratios, hypotenuse over, uh, pardon me, uh, opposite over hypotenuse, adjacent over hypotenuse, opposite over adjacent, and then performed basically division for each, all right, they would end up uh, correlating to this, cotangent and tangent, respectively. The new thing um, that's more complicated than that are these, the even and odd identities, all right? Now, we've discussed even and odd functions before, which has to, to do with symmetry, all right? Basically, you just need to identify uh, where there is a negative, all right? And then just realize that the graph of the, the tangent of a negative angle, that is that you've been moving clockwise as opposed to counterclockwise, would produce the exact same graph as if you put the negative out in front right? and applied the negative as an afterthought rather than as the input. You get it as an output. Um, anyhow, these would produce similar graphs. Same could be said for these. Anything that is written this way, these uh, specifically tangent, cotangent, sine, and uh, cosecant, they're odd functions in terms of their symmetry. Um, that means that you have to reflect them twice, right? Reflect them horizontally and then vertically in order to produce matching graphs, right? Um, I'm gonna draw you a diagram to remind you in a minute, but the other two, uh, cosine and secant, um, Notice the input is negative here and here, but the output just remains positive. They're even functions, right? Even functions have horizontal symmetry, right? That is, if you reflected them over the y-axis, they would produce the same picture, okay? Then there's the Pythagorean identities, which I was just alluding to. I mentioned this one, and we'll go through this again. There are alter alternatively these two as well, okay? So have this document which summarizes anything that you would need for section 9.1 available. You can print this. All right. Okay. Just as factoring is the basic tool of solving equations, algebraic equations, identities are useful for solving trigonometric equations. All right. And all of this can be related back, all functions can be related back to a unit circle. All right. uh, let's start with the Pythagorean identity. That's my favorite one, if you can't tell. <laughs> right. We have famously the Pythagorean theorem. 
And if I have to turn on the light, I will, I promise. That looks dull point. Okay. That's an E, I swear. Pythagorean theorem, which is specifically for, remember, right triangles in any orientation, and there should be the box that symbolizes 90 degree angle in one of the corners. Okay. And the most important dimension would be the hypotenuse, which is directly across from it. Right? Famously, the Pythagorean theorem is a squared plus b squared equals c squared. It's a bit dismal today, so I might have to turn the light on. Uh, let's just test the theory. Is that really improving? Kind of does. All right. All right. I'm, I'm, I don't really like the overhead light. I find it kind of a uh, overbearing, but as long as it's making this more legible, that's a good thing. So, but I digress. You know that from a right triangle, um, these two things are interchangeable, what are known, known normally as legs. This is a leg, this is a second leg, all right? The one thing that is non-negotiable is the hypotenuse, right? And again, it is good to be able to identify the box that represents a 90 degree angle, um, not just to uh, certify that this is a right triangle, which is the only application for the Pythagorean theorem, all right? But the hypotenuse is always the dimension directly across from it, all right? And if C represents that, then this would be the dimension of C, all right? As for A and B, the legs, you could uh, make this A and that B, or this A and that B. I stick with this logic. I would say that B is in bottom, all right? So let's we'll call this B for bottom, and this A for altitude. It's really stretching the logic, I know, but hey, whatever. It works. Um, now, how does that correlate to our uh, trig functions? Well, you know that in a unit circle, I'm going to try to draw this as neat as possible. The radius is one. So if I create a circle by stretching out a radius, or, and it's equal to one, all right? And then rotate through um, 360 degrees, normally it is counterclockwise in which we do that, um, from zero to 360, that any point on the circle, and it's a baby drawn circle, I admit, um, any point on this circle could be identified by the ordered pairs that are x and y. If you take it one step further, all right, and translate this into uh, trigonometric ratios, all right, and bear in mind this has to be a unit circle for this to be true, in which case the radius is one, that if the sine of an angle, let's call the angle theta in here, it's very faint. So I'm trying to make this a little darker. See, I'm trying to leave a little space underneath here to do some extra work. Um, to make this a little bit more legible, here's what I've drawn inside the triangle. There is the angle, there is this right triangle formed, linking the center to the edge of the circle, like that. Right. Notice that the um, x dimension, which is this way, um, does not extend all the way to the edge of the circle. It can't. All right because what has to be the largest dimension of any right triangle, even one that is sort of inscribed in the inside of the circle? One is the maximum, so the parts, the legs, have to be something smaller than that. Right. Anyhow, the radius is maintained in terms of length all the way around, right? but the dimensions 
that our x and y right, um, will fluctuate. Right? Now, again, I'm trying to preserve some space here, but how would we calculate these, right, x and y? Right? Well, what we could do is this. We could consider um, our trig function ratios of our, our trigonometric I. Uh, trig, uh, yes, they are trig function ratios opposite of the angle, and the angle would be here, in here, in my drawing in this picture here, over hypotenuse. Right? There's the abbreviation from Sokotoa. Right? And now translate that to the dimension labels in either one of these two drawings. So if I'm sort of superimposing this upon a coordinate plane, uh, the appropriate dimensions would be x's and y's, right? Or potentially r for the radius of a circle. Right? That means then that the sine of the angle here, or here, is opposite of that. So it would be y, right? Um, the hypotenuse would be in a unit circle labeled r. Right? And then, even though we don't know what the y dimension is, all right, if it's a unicircle, you can make the assumption that the radius is 1, which means that this equation simplifies right, to simply this, that the sine of theta is really just y right, for a unit circle. So to fill in that information here, if you wanted to calculate y, let's say y is equal to the sine of the angle. Right? Similarly, right, if you had done the same thing for x, right, you would opt for a different trig function, of course, but um, I may have to get a towel because this is a little wet. Um, you may have to opt for a different trig function, right? but you'll get a similarly concise, uh, more concise incarnation of trigonometric ratios. Why? Because you're going to use r equals 1. Right? Let me get a towel. as evidence of that, if you wanted to calculate the x value, the bottom of a right triangle, um, sort of inscribed in this badly drawn circle, badly drawn but uh, still meaningful I hope, here's a different, my black markers always go fastest. Yeah. The appropriate trig function would be cosine of the angle. And you know from Sokotoa, right, which is good for any orientation triangle, that um, uh, the mnemonic would uh, indicate that the, the ratio here should be adjacent, which I'm just going to abbreviate ADJ over hypotenuse HYP. That is a J, I swear. Okay, so in respect of the angle in the triangle here, what is adjacent? X. What is still the hypotenuse? R. And if again, you're considering this in terms of the unit circle's dimensions, then the radius has to be 1. All right. So this would be dumbed down, for lack of a nicer expression, a nicer expression, to this, okay? that the x is equal to cosine of x, uh, cosine of theta equals x. Again, in this situation of the unit circle. Okay? 
of which other circles would be proportionate. Okay? I'm sorry, that's very faint. sine of the angle. X is really just cosine of the angle. Now where am I going with this? Back to the Pythagorean theorem. If again this correlates to um, a right triangle in general, this is the formula for Pythagorean theorem when you're discussing a right triangle in general, let's adapt it. Let's first say to ourselves, well, instead of calling this A, let's call this um, what it would be uh, superimposed upon a coordinate plane, Y. So this would really be Y squared. And instead of calling this B, right, on a uh, coordinate plane, the bottom would be X. So you have X squared. I'm gonna erase this right now, because I need the space. And C, instead of calling it C as in the formula for hypotenuse, it would be a radius, would be the hypotenuse. So this is the radius squared. Right. Equals equals, this is still squared, this is still squared, this is still squared. Right. And this is still a right triangle to complete that torque. Okay. Taking it one step further and filling in what these relate to in terms of trigonometric functions, all right, and a number, all right, would reduce uh, this to, or produce rather, the first trig identity, that is the Pythagorean identities. Right. Using trig identities, trig functions, we could say that instead of this being y, it's what y is in terms of a unit circle. Sine of theta. And x is cosine of theta. And r is 1 equals. There is one other thing I'm going to add, which is the exponents of 2. And I want to show you something. The shorthand notation for a squared trig function usually situates the exponent of 2 here, right, in front of the, the angle, the input. Right? It is not wrong to write this on the very far outside and then put a parenthesis around the whole thing. You can if you want to. It means exactly the same thing. But the tendency is to do it like that. All right? And in the case of 1, it's kind of superfluous because what's 1 squared? It's just 1. Anyhow, as you can see, that's the first trig identity. Sine squared of theta plus cosine of squared of theta equals 1. And it all goes back to the Pythagorean theorem. The other two trig functions are derived similarly. Um, I'm going to do that really quick. 
obviously taking advantage of the relationships between um, the three, ba three main trig functions, sine, cosine, and tangent, um, to adapt it to secant, cosine, uh, pardon me, cosecant, and um, cotangent. So for example, um, if you had this to begin with, all right, sine squared of theta plus the cosine squared of theta equals one. And then, again, you're trying to adapt this to the other three trig functions, cotangent, secant, and cosecant. If you manipulate this, like so, right, by multiplying by the reciprocal of sine, since that's up in the front here. The reciprocal of sine uh, using the word sine would be this. Okay, It's not going to do much uh, to help doing that, but I'm essentially going to take this term and modify it slightly more in a moment, but distribute it to each of these contents. And bear in mind, you could get away with doing this, as I often say. You can get away with murder in that as long as you're consistent. So if you did it to this side of equals, it's perfectly legal as long as you do it to both sides of equals. Right. What I have to do, and you'll see why in a moment, is um, change the reciprocal of sine uh, ever so slightly all right, to cause a cancellation effect. Now, how would I do that if the sine here happens to be squared? Well, I would just make the reciprocal squared as well. Right? And then the result is this. If you think of these things that are not written in a rational style, but as being something that is really a numerator, the top of each of these, right, then that would naturally make the bottoms one, right, to preserve the values of each. Right? Now, as you distribute the, the somewhat arbitrarily decided reciprocal of sine out here, you'll see what the effect is. This times this and this times this produce the sine squared of theta that was there, Easter egg, right? And then this is the denominator as well. That is strategically so that you have something, even something ugly and complicated as a trig function, with all due respect to trig functions, all right, that is going to cancel. Strategically so. Right. I'll get there. Well, let's complete this thought. If I distribute it to cosine, this would be uh, this would be cosine squared of theta, sitting on top of sine squared of theta. And then the same thing would be 1 here. 1 over the sine squared of theta. This would naturally cancel out. It's something divided by itself, assuming that the amount here is not 0. Right? You would have 1 in this position. In this case, you have cosine squared of theta and sine squared of theta, which if you feel like it, if it makes it more obvious to you, you could just push this to the outside in each case and read it like this. If I'm grouping the top and the bottom like this now, writing the exponent of 2 here, uh, would imply that both of these things are being squared without having to write that. Anyhow, cosine of theta sitting on top of the sine of theta might be familiar to you, and if it isn't, let me remind you. All right, here's this handout again. Look down here at the quotients. All right, cosine on top, sine on the bottom is cotangent. So this becomes the cotangent squared of theta, right? Just putting the two back in the middle, okay?
And then, then there's this last little adjustment here. Under normal conditions, right? And if you want, you could do the same thing here. Right, this like so here. The reciprocal of sine is which um, extra trig function? The bottom three, I always like to call them. Right? The reciprocal of sine is cosecant. Right? Notice where cosecant is located in this uh, identity here, as a denominator. What if the sine itself is the denominator? Then you switch these. And that means that this is cosecant of theta squared. And again, to square one is superfluous. You're going to get one no matter what. Anyhow, this is the second Pythagorean identity. It incorporates one, all right, which is appropriate for you in a circle anyhow. All right, but now it utilizes cotangent and cosecant, all right, which means that if you have those, perhaps you could rearrange this for the sake of simplifying so that the end result is just one. In other words, if I left one here and moved this over to here via subtraction, since it's being added, then if I end up coming across um, some bundle of cosecant squared, all right, minus cosine, cotangent squared, then I could just replace that little factor with one, all right. That's a long-term uh, plan here, all right. Um, then there's the last one. And it has a similar uh, sort of uh, strategy. I'll do this a little bit faster. Okay. Here again, let's say that you start with our, our trig identity. Um, sine squared of theta plus cosine squared of theta equals 1. And you want to manipulate this such that the end result has some other trig function other than these two, right? but is usable. Um, in a situation like this, you might, instead of strategically trying to cancel out the sine here, strategically try to cancel out cosine. So what you might do is use the reciprocal of cosine squared as well, because there happens to be a two here. And then in order to get away with this, just be consistent, all right? Distribute it to each of these, right. which means the first one is going to be, ooh, that worked, it's so nice to screen today. All right. Sine squared over cosine squared of theta plus the cosine squared of theta over the cosine squared of theta is equal to one over the cosine squared of theta. All right. Now again, if it makes more sense, all right, makes it a little bit more obvious what this uh, relates to, this first term, if you write this like that instead, it is equivalent to what it was, but now you will see that the sine of theta over the cosine of theta is the quotient that is tangent of theta. Right. Again, not to beat a dead horse, but you use your references a lot in trigonometry. Here's tangent, here's what we had. Um, this one, again, if you want, you could write it like this instead. Two here. Something divided by itself, assuming that it isn't zero, all right, cancels, and you're just left with one. And then you have this situation, all right? We put two here instead, all right? That's a funny way to write cosine, all right? There's an S there, all right? Cosine is the reciprocal of secant, all right? Normally, secant would be written in the place of a denominator, 
all right? But if the cosine is already down there, just flip it, all right? And then you have this, secant of theta squared is the end result. All right, uh, just to point that one more time here, here is what cosine is normally uh, oriented. Cosine of theta is, its reciprocal is one over secant of theta. Um, if you just switch the position of these, you would get the equivalent statement. Basically, the situation you see here is this um, rearranged. Okay, so uh, that makes, there should be a square here too. This last one is the third of the trigonometric uh, Pythagorean identities. Okay. And again, if you ever are in a situation where you have tangent squared and secant squared, you might strategically try to rearrange these parts, these terms, so that you end up with one as a result. In other words, you can replace whatever factor is secant squared minus tangent squared, right, with just the number one, because that's what it would relate to. You'll see in a couple minutes. Okay. All right, let me just uh, remind you a little bit about symmetry, and I'll give you an overview of strategy to get through uh, identities and equations, and then we'll stop. Okay. about the origin. it basically looks like you, right? It's really you backwards, so it's not exactly how you look to other people, right? It isn't like a photograph. It is everything backwards. If you have a mole on your neck, then it's on the opposite side, really, in your reflection, all right? Um, however, all right, for all intents and purposes, all right, if you have horizontal symmetry, what that means is that a graph looks the same, completely the same. Um, after reflecting over the y-axis, if it has horizontal symmetry. That's a bit. Here is a coordinate plane, axes, yeah. x and y, respectively. If you were to uh, start with a parabola, say, right, and then reflect the point here over the y-axis, moving this way is horizontal, of course, right? 
you would have to do the same thing to all of these points. Right? And this point as well, right, would have to be reflected this way. And what you would end up with before and after is the same parabola, right? So the graphs look the same after reflecting over the y-axis. It's kind of um, unfortunate that when you think y, you think vertical, all right? You don't necessarily think horizontal, but we're talking about the y-axis and reflection occurring in this dimension, which is horizontal, right? Functions that behave this way, and famously, uh, y equals x squared, which produces parabolas, right? um, have horizontal symmetry. We call them even functions. Um, if you were to discuss the function notation, um, F italicized uh, depth parentheses x, right? So horizontally reflect, right? Is to basically <coughs> put a negative in the input. All right. Anyhow, these would be truly equal because you would produce the same graph even in spite of this input being negative here. Okay. Um, when you have this situation, symmetry about the origin, what this means is that the graphs look the same after reflecting in two dimensions. Um, horizontally, which is over the y-axis, and then vertically as well, which is over the x-axis. Right. How, to, how to say that a little bit more concisely? In respect of the origin, about the origin. Right, because the horizontal axis and the vertical, or I mean the, the horizontal axis and the vertical axis cross at the origin. Right. So if your graph looks the same after reflecting over the horizontal and then the vertical axes, right, then you would say um, that you have an odd function. Right. Famously, this y of x again, um, the function that is the cubic function, exponent of 3 as opposed to exponent of 2, which kind of makes a parabola drooping on one side, sort of the stay alive movement, you know, um, would look the same. after flipping horizontally this way, and then flipping horizontally this way. All right, you would end up with the same graph having done that. All right. Let's say that you started with this point here, all right, where the arrow is. Right. If you move horizontally, that is reflect over the, the y-axis, that may be a little faint. Consider this point here, right, and you reflect it horizontally over the y-axis, all right, it would be here, all right. This at the same time would go here. Right? Then if you took the time to reflect it again, but now over the x-axis, this point would become that point, and this point would become that point. And the bottom line is that your graphs would look exactly the same 
all right? Not even as though it was a mirror even, all right? I mean, exactly as things look, all right? Um, after the ref if reflecting horizontally and vertically in the bottom, and I can't emphasize that enough, it has to be both. Do both of those in order to make that the situation. Anyhow, horizontal symmetry means you have an even function. Symmetry about the origin means that you have a horizontal function. And again, in terms of function notation, um, this would be true. Um, if you had a negative input like so, all right, to start with, then right. these types of graphs would be true like this. Notice where the negative is here as an output, or part of the output, versus here starting as part of the input. This is just saying that if you have something like this, it's going to be equivalent to as if you had it as an amplitude, all right, as an output negative. All right. Again, in the um, even odd identities, all right, there are more odd than there are even all right, here. In the frame, notice that you have a negative input for tangent, and then on this side you have a negative output. Okay, inputs negative, inputs negative, inputs negative, and the negatives are on the outside. All right, these four are odd functions. All right, so they will only produce graphs that look the same as a result of um, reflecting horizontally and then vertically as well. Okay. Whereas uh, cosine and secant are even functions. Right? I wrote it kind of sloppy here, but uh, if you want, right, label these two. I drew a little caliper to sort of squeeze them together. Those are even, these two, and these four are odd. All right? And that's basically everything, all right, as far as identities to section 9.1. A lot of it you knew already. You're familiar with cofunctions. It's just saying that the sine and cosine and anything that is a co-function, they're offset by 90 degrees. They're out of phase. They're the same picture, all right, but chipped it. All right. Okay. All right. Now, as far as strategy is concerned, Test with is well two things from this point. 
something visually, so graphically. All right, in which case, what does that mean? It means plug in uh, each half of an equation, both sides, and then compare them. to be able to manipulate the equations. So algebraically, and I might run out of space here, it's a little bit more involved. Uh, just to reiterate this, by plug in each half of an equation, I mean Pretend that each half by itself is y equals something, all right? And see if the pictures are superimposed, all right? If they're perfectly superimposed, then one half equals the other half. They produce the same graph. Um, you're more likely going to be doing this uh, to attempt to verify algebraically. Um, here's the overall strategy, right? One of two things, really. One, start with or work the more complicated side. side that might be just one say lonely tree function and another side that looks like a bunch of gobbledygook. Basically it's the gobbledygook that you want to focus on. Zero in on the more complicated side. Okay. And how to do that? Well um, look for opportunities. Strategy one, right? Strategy two is simply attempt to factor everything into sines and cosines. Try to convert. thing, all right, but this is a more intricate description, all right, and sometimes you don't end up with, in theory, just sine or cosine, but to get your feet wet, all right, this is basically a simpler perspective of the same strategy, all right, you're trying to take something ugly and complicated and reduce it to sine or cosine because that's a little bit more warm and fuzzy, all right, just beware, sometimes it's not the, the work that you do is not really just those two things. And this is really what's going on here. That's the intricate detail. All right. It's easier than it sounds, really. Let me show you. 
theta. And then immediately adjacent to it, you have the cosine of theta. And this equals the sine of theta. Right. If we're sticking with the more intricate detail here, which is to work the more complicated side, arguably, of these two sides, which is the one that's more complicated? I would say this one, only for the reason that it has two parts, two factors. Right? And they're not exclusively sines and cosines either. So, if I zero in on this, right, um, there isn't much I can do in terms of factoring, right? and squaring would not be helpful to me in this instance. Right? And I can't really add anything. Right? What I might do is try this, to substitute some known identity. In which case, I would remind you to look at this table again. Right? Here's your roadmap. What can you translate tangent into? Well, according to the quotient identities, and there's only two of those, um, sine over cosine is what tangent is. So if I replace this with its equivalent of sine of theta, over the cosine of theta. And it is simultaneously understood that this cosine of theta is they pressed together, that this is being multiplied. If you treat them like fractions in the respect of having a, a top and a top and a bottom and a bottom, look what happens with the cosines. Right? They would cross cancel. And what would that leave you with? Just the top which means that you would have sine of theta verified as the outcome. Now again, if you were inclined to do this using your calculator to verify, the pictures should look the same before and after. Right, let's test out that theory. Right. something. I gotta clear out my old stuff in here. Clear. Right. Here is to begin with the sine function. And if you hit graph, there is a terrible drawing. <laughs> this is an example of you have to change the screen dimensions because it did not draw at all what it's supposed to look like. So I'm gonna go for the automatic rather than the manual transmission here. Hit zoom. Let's try Z trig. Seven. There we go. That looks more normal. And that is indeed a sine function. If I type in tangent of theta times cosine of theta, as if this was, if this is y1 in my list of functions to graph, let's call this y2. Right? If I type in just this half, right, to verify graphically, the pictures should be completely and perfectly superimposed, which means that no distinction. Right. So we'll go back here. Here's y equals, just under this, I'm gonna try to, oh, uh, yeah, I erased it. <laughs> Sine of x, there we go. And underneath this, I'm gonna type tangent of x next to cosine of x. Okay, I'll scroll over so you can see what I typed. Okay, for y2, tangent of x times this um, asterisk for multiplication is probably superfluous, um, but I always prefer to avoid any syntax error whenever I can. So now that I hit graph, you'll see it first draw a sign as it's supposed to be, this little uh, meter sort of over here is uh, the cursor. It's like a clock. Still thinking? Notice that there is no distinction. All right, you get completely superimposed, perfectly one behind the other graphs. All right, let's say I went back to y equals and deleted out y1. And now just graph y2. There's your sine function yet again. 
as it should be. Okay, so use your calculator as always to verify, to give you, you know, to validate. A little comfort. Moving on. Oh, it's becoming prettier. We're getting a nice day here. Now that the rain has passed, is that even done? I should probably do one. Alright. As I said, I just find that light above me oppressive. Yeah. Alright, let's do a more complicated one. I'm gonna erase this just for the sake of space. Suppose you start with something like this. One plus the sine of, and in your textbook, sometimes they opt for a different input variable. We use x instead of theta. And one parentheses, and then adjacent to it, uh, one plus the sine of negative input x is equal to cosine squared of x. Again, always convince yourself, I'm going to try to whittle away at the uglier side of this, the more complicated side. And I would argue that's more complicated than just uh, cosine squared. So, then amongst these two factors, just to distinguish one from the other, Which of these looks like it might be more trouble? Or well, let's put it in a more positive uh, um, perspective. Uh, which one is, I'm corrupting your opinion already. <laughs> which one is uh, a little bit more interesting than the other? You know, in that it is unusual. Um, I would argue the thing that has a negative in it. All right. So, where would that lead me? I would lead me to looking at my reference Oh, geez, what, do I, what can I do with this? Right. Well, we just got done talking about the even and odd identities. Right. And what we have here is sine with a negative input. Right. What does that produce? Sine with a negative input can be rewritten essentially as the negative on the outside, essentially as, a, as an output. Right. They would produce the same picture right, if you were to graph them. So I'm going to rewrite this, which is given, like that. And that's going to produce, instead of plus sign, minus sign. And I'm starting to wonder, look at the inconsistency in my writing, all right? Script S, ooh, all right? Non-script S, sorry. I get made it myself for that. That looks, if I don't mind saying, that looks kind of nice, but hey, be consistent when you're writing, right? S, there you go. So this is still one. And this is still like so. And I'll just put this back. Bear in mind, we're just paying attention to the left here. 
Uh, I just add some further distinction. Alright, now, doesn't this look eerily familiar? You have, although there's trig functions at play, um, you have uh, two terms here that are almost exactly the same except for the signs here. Yeah. So, that might resemble something that you already know, which is this. The difference of two squares. Meaning that's what the end result is going to resemble, right? The difference of just two terms, all right, that happen to be squared. Right? Granted, there are four terms in total here, but because of this minus in this situation and this plus in this situation, there's going to be some cancellation effect. Just as the difference of two squares normally produces, right? Um, before I get ahead of myself, let me just make a little notation here. The adjustment that occurred here is taking advantage of the even function of sum, right? Even odd identity uh, for sum, right? To have a negative input means that you can alternatively write it as a negative output to get the same picture. All right, and now we're going to apply this. I'll put a little thought balloon here. If you had, um, you know, x minus 1 and x plus 1, you could FOIL it by distributing the contents to each of the other contents, in which case x times x will be x squared, x times 1 will be plus x, 1, and then distribute these two. Negative 1 times x would be minus 1x, and negative 1 times positive 1 would be negative 1. And the stuff in the middle, because they are equal but opposite um, quantities, equal in magnitude, opposite in direction, they would cancel. And you'd be left with this according to the, the normal algebraic situation for the difference of two squares. The bottom line is you're going to get one squared minus sine squared. Right? If you feel a little uneasy about it, then don't feel bad. Do the intricate foiling. Right. And I'm going to foil this. Distribute 1 to 1. You get 1 multiplied. 1 times negative sine is minus the sine of x. Right. Do the same thing. Sine of x times 1 here is now a positive incarnation of this. So you see positive sine of x, and then sine times sine, and this one is negative. A positive times a negative is a negative. The abbreviation for something times itself is just what? It's squared. So you have sine squared of x. Okay. Now what happens is that you have a quantity minus another quantity. All right, that are identical except for their um, direction. All right, so what's something minus itself essentially? It cancels out of existence. All right, no matter how ugly or complicated it is, something by sheer logic alone, something of opposite sign but equal magnitude will cancel out of existence. So you're left with one minus the sine squared of x. And again, if you would prefer to put the two here, all right grouped on the outside of the function, that's cool. There's nothing wrong with that, all right? Nothing wrong with that at all, all right? Not wrong. Um, it's just that the tendency is to put the two here. I don't know why my glasses keep slipping off my face. All right, it must be greasy, all right? Anyhow, we have gone as far as we can with the left side of equals here, all right? We can't do, make heads and tails any further with this. Right. Now, I'm just going to drag what's left over on the right side down here to write it adjacent. And you'll see something that might start to look familiar, familiar to you. So you see equals and then the cosine squared of x. Right. Although it is out of whack, 
again point at the handout. This has all the features of one, a sine function squared and a cosine function squared of um, trigonometric, pardon me, Pythagorean identities, right? It's the first one, the one that involves sine and cosine, just rearranged. If I were to take sine squared plus cosine squared and rearrange it to basically um, move the, uh, the sine to the opposite side, if it's positive on this side, to justify moving it over equals is to do opposite operations, to perform opposite operations. Right. I'll put it up here because I'm running out of space. What I'm getting at is that the, the usual situation normally of sine squared of theta plus cosine squared of theta equaling 1 can be manipulated so that we have this on one side, what is in red here, and it is what I'm trying to imitate with the, uh, the normal identity. And let's see what it would take to accomplish that. This is a flip cloud here. Well, if it's a positive sign on this side, and I want to justify moving it, and mind you, this is the identity, it's not the problem at hand. The justification for moving anything over equals is to perform the opposite operation. The opposite of adding is subtracting. And there's a cancellation effect on purpose. Right? And if you did it here, you're obligated to do it there. So you have minus sine squared of theta. Right? That means what? It means the thing that is left over here, cosine squared, is equal to 1 minus the sine squared of theta. Right? That, which is written in blue on the right, is what I have here written on the left in red. That confirms that what we got here is equal to that. Right? It's just the Pythagorean identity, first one, manipulated, rearranged. Let's do maybe an ugly one. No, um, let me switch. Let's do the, the, the second thing I had planned, which is to create an identity of sorts, all right, from scratch. That is that you will be given an expression, um, just sort of free-floating, not part of an equation. There's no equals to start with, but you want to see what you could uh, uh, change it into. You want to create. try to rewrite 
cotangent of theta, and it was sitting next to uh, the secant of theta. It might seem a little silly, all right, but what you want to do is take the problem as it's given to you, all right, two tangent of theta, secant of theta, and then multiply because they're pressed together. Not optional. And make it look like an equation. So that you have um, two of these, all right? I'm going to put an equals here since we're creating an identity. Identities are equations for all types of purposes. Put um, what you're going to manipulate on one side or the other. Right? I'll put it on the right side. It doesn't really matter. Okay. And over here, I'll rewrite this. Two tangents of theta. Basically, the end result that I'm going to manipulate in red right, is going to be equivalent to the original thing, two tangent of theta, secant of theta. But it will be expressed in terms of sign only. So with the red side essentially is going to be something that is sign. It might be uglier than what is here, right? but it will be just using sign. So let's see what we can get away with. Okay. Um, the number two, we can't do anything with, so we're going to basically ignore that. All right. But tangent, right? Zero in on tangent. Right off the bat, all right? Tangent can be replaced with the um, the quotient identity that is specifically for tangent, and there's two of them, right? What does tangent, if you have your reference, right, what could tangent be changed into? It could be changed into this, the sine of theta sitting on top of the cosine of theta. There's still this two here, not going away. And I'll just keep the equal sign to keep a barrier, if you will, as we work our way down. And uh, now shift our focus over to secant, all right? If the whole goal here is to change the appearance of this so that it has a sine in it, all right, then perhaps we could dismiss the cosine portion of this, all right? We opted for something that tangent relates to, all right, that has a sine in it. The quotient identity has a sine in it. But I want to make this go away, all right, if I can help it, all right? Secant happens to be the reciprocal, if I shift focus to here, it happens to be the reciprocal, so it's going to be a denominator, of which trig function? Right, cosine. Secant of theta is really the same as 1 over cosine of theta. Right. And you might say, well, good luck, buddy. All right, you didn't make it worse. Now there's two cosines. Don't don't panic. All right, stick with me. My story gets better. All right. If you now treat these like fractions, that is, this has a top, this has a top, this has a bottom, this has a bottom, numerator and denominator, whatever you want to call them. All right, and they are being multiplied because they are butted up against each other. All right, we can write this more concisely as the combination, the product, which means that now. From doing sine times one, we would have sine of theta on top. There's still this free floating two. And then bottom times bottom would be abbreviated as cosine squared. And I'm going to put the, the exponent of two in the typical place, which is between uh, the function and the input. Now, again, remember. When you see something squared, all right, a little alarm should go off in your head and go, oh geez, what does this look familiar? The Pythagorean identity, all right? Now we may have to manipulate the Pythagorean identity, all right, and I'll do that over here, all right, or wherever there's space, all right? 
but here's a little thought cloud. Um, the Pythagorean identity is sine squared of theta plus the cosine squared of theta equals one. If I wanted to basically replace what is written down here with the guts of this identity, I would have to isolate cosine squared, which basically means I would do similar to what I had before, move um, sine squared right, in the identity to figure out what cosine squared would be equivalent to. Right? Cosine squared, as before, would be the equivalent of one minus sine squared. Because in order to justify moving sine squared from one side of equals to the other, you do you perform opposite operations. So if it's a positive on one side, it would naturally be a negative on the other. That's what I'm going to replace cosine with. And that means that this original thing, two sine, pardon me, two tangent theta times secant of theta, rewritten in terms of sine only, would be this. It would be two sine of theta because that's the guts on top. And the replaced incarnation of Pythagorean identity for cosine and sine, that is this, one minus the sine squared of theta. This is what we're after, and this is what it was originally. To simplify the work, sometimes it's useful to reinterpret the trig function into algebraic expressions. It's sort of like u substitution. You, you use the, the variable u just not to get bogged down by certain details while you're working. Um, this is what I mean. Suppose you had uh, the task of writing write this using X's. Two cosine squared of theta plus the cosine of theta minus one using x's instead of theta, well, instead of the trig function. I'm not just saying that you're going to replace theta with x, right? you could do that, uh, but to replace the, um, the actual entire trig function with just the letter x, making it like u substitution, you're just kind of filling in that space Right, just not to get distracted with anything more complicated. Right, then what would happen is that you'd basically be saying that this, um, of the two of them, cosine of theta is equal to x. I'd be putting an x here. All right, and then this would be x squared. So you see this. This is a type of u-substitution. 
using X's instead. Ah, sorry. I'm like I'm paying attention here. X minus one. Why do something like this? Because it might make it a little bit easier to factor, right? And if this was part of some equation and it were quadratic like this, that it has an exponent of two in descending order, three terms, all right? Then it might be practical to sort of look at it from this perspective, which is, you know, presumably familiar, uh, rather than keep it what it was, less familiar. And then you could always back substitute it as an afterthought. Here's another situation. Uh, suppose you had four cosine squared of theta minus one. Right? I'm going to replace um, the trig function with x. In this instance, you would have something like so, right? Recalling cosine squared x instead, right? You don't have to worry about any extra feature. So it would just be 4x squared minus 1, all right? The benefit of doing that is that, again, if you had to factor, this is something that simulates the difference of two squares model for factoring. It's a little disguised, you'd have to tinker with it a little bit further, but um, there's the difference. It's two things. One of them is evidently squared. And if we were to manipulate this even further, this could be rewritten as 2x, the whole chunk squared by itself. And this 1 could just simply be reinterpreted as 1 squared. It's superfluous, it's unnecessary, but it makes it more obvious right, that it is the difference of two things that are being squared. So it will be easier to factor. Right. Um, let me complete that thought now. We have identified what using x instead of cosine squared in this place, that this is really what the term would simplify to, just 2x. Then, according to the difference of two squares model for factoring, it would be nearly identical factors using these symbols, 1 and 2x specifically here and here and here and here, respectively, but they'd be conjugates, really. They'd have opposite signs. So, a 2x would be here. And the 2x would be here. And a 1 would be here. And a 1 would be here. And either one of them would be positive and the other negative. And then, as an afterthought, back substitute. Or sort of reverse substitute would be more perhaps better to say. Reverse the substitution. If we had started with this, we substituted cosine squared with an x. And I'm going to do that in reverse at this point means that this is how it factors completely to end this. It would be 2 um, cosine of theta and 2 cosine of theta 1 and 1 and plus and minus. And this would be this thing factored. I should correct myself. We're in this situation up here, still use 
cosine of theta as what you're substituting for, right? Um, because if I had just done it cosine squared, it would be 4x. It would be 4x rather than 4x squared. I need it to be squared. So this is fine. I'm sorry. Not to confuse you. Right. And that makes it fit here and here much better. Okay. Um. All right. Um, I have to correct myself. Um, equations is actually section nine five. Um, so let me do one more identity, which is kind of a complicated one, and then I'll stop. Okay, for the day, and we'll reserve since it's where it actually occurs. Equations of this sort are section nine five, which will be Tuesday, right. coming Tuesday. Let me do one more of these ugly things, and then we'll stop. I guess the, it's fair to say the, the purpose of section 9.1 is to acclimate to identities. And once that has occurred, and which takes time, um, then you could apply them for the purpose of solving an equation. So, let's see. One more of these terrible, I shouldn't say that, I'm such a bad example. Um, one more of these involved sort of problems. And then I'll call it quits. Uh, let's see. Verifying again. Uh, one minus the cosine squared of x. And then one plus the cotangent squared of x. And this is equal to one. All right. Remember the strategy from before. Right? You're always going to start with the more complicated side. Right? And arguably, what could be more simple than one? Perhaps zero, right? So we're going to try to get this to look like that. But we're not going to throw things on the, that side. That's what's different about this from solving equations. When you're solving equations, you're strategically moving things around, right? Via opposite operations. When you're trying to verify something, you're kind of creating a barrier here and you're preserving that all right you just want to imitate that so your focus is really just on the left here and the second thing is you're going to try to reduce this to something that is just sine or cosine and if they don't specify that it has to be one or the other they could be both right? so um what would happen in this case all right Notice that you have something that is squared and it's cosine and it involves the number one. What does this resemble? From identities, this is the Pythagorean identity that is sine squared of theta plus the cosine squared of theta equaling one. It's just rearranged. How so? Well, if you notice that it is a negative cosine, then that means that cosine squared has been thrown over equals in the identity, not in the verification, all right? So that means this. It means that one minus cosine squared of theta is the other side. So at this point here, we could slip in sine squared of theta. We've taken something that was two terms and we've reduced it to one term, so progress. Okay. All right, as for the other one, there's probably more than one way to do this. If we considered the, um, the Pythagorean identities, 
I'm going to point to it again. It is maybe possible to replace this exactly as you see it. And if not, there's always another door, a back door, if you will. We can change this into a uh, ratio. Um, but I want to see if I can get away with uh, re replacing this. Right. If you notice in the Pythagorean identities, right, 1 plus cotangent squared would reduce right off the bat to cosecant squared. Right? And therefore, cosecant squared can be replaced with sine. That's probably the easier route to go. If you didn't intuitively do it that way, don't feel bad, all right? It's certainly never a bad thing to go through a mental exercise as long as it produces the same result in the end. There's often more than one way to do something in math, all right? especially with identities. So I'll do it two ways. I'll do it what I think is probably the easier way first, and then I'll do it the hard way. This, according to, um, Again, Pythagorean identities. This is the first one, this is the second one. One plus cotangent squared of theta is already established as being cosecant squared of theta. Right? That means that I can just replace what is here already with this cosecant squared of theta. And you might say, well, bravo, that doesn't really reduce it to just sine and cosine, but we're getting there. These are Pythagorean identities. That's all of our, that I've used at this point. What I might do now is opt for moving the square outside of the function, right? It's the same uh, deal, it's just an alternative way of writing. Meaning, if I wrote it like this instead, this is equivalent with the two here. It's not hurting it. Two on the outside. It's just that in this form, I could take advantage of the reciprocal identity. One over sine is what cosecant really represents. Meanwhile, there's still this, sine squared of theta, sitting adjacent. It's not necessary, it is superfluous to put this, this fraction bar here, but since I'm going to ultimately combine these things eventually, it might be practical to look at it like that. Anyhow, at this point, you could reintroduce the square, right? Something factored to the outside is really affecting both of these things, so it would be 1 squared, which is just 1, all right? Uh, let's see. This just becomes 1. I'm running out of space, so I'm going to do it here. 1 sitting on top of sine squared of theta is what this chunk here reduces to. And therefore, it is really sine squared times 1, and one is a denominator times sine squared, which is something ugly and complicated, but something ugly and complicated divided by itself. Essentially, it is sine squared of theta sitting on top of itself. So what's something divided by itself? One, right? The more complicated way of dealing with this would be to not have recognized that cosecant is a reciprocal and more so, not to have recognized that this is a Pythagorean identity. The only thing that you might have recognized is this. That cotangent by itself can be written like that. I don't know if it's visible. 1 plus the cotangent of theta. It's a little wet. I should have tried that better. And that cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent. All right? 
and each of those could be translated into um, a quotient identity. Tangent is sine over cosine. Then cotangent would be cosine over sine. Just so happens to be squared. And there's a one still sitting here. put the square back, applying it to each of these things, you would have 1 plus cosine squared of theta over the sine squared of theta. And then you would have to try, which would at least fit the objective of, while I'm trying to get rid of anything that isn't cosine or sine, that would technically be correct. But at this point, you'd have to worry about, for the sake of simplicity, trying to combine one with this glorified fraction here. All right? And in that case, you would take what the denominator is, right? And reinterpret the amount of one using that denominator, even if it's squared. It might seem kooky, but again, if you started with this, this uh, on this path, you will get to that eventually if you just stick it through. It's just um, a little bit more complicated than say going directly. Now, the ratio of sine squared of theta over sine squared of theta produces two fractions that can actually be added. Right? Just like in the case of regular ordinary fractions, you don't combine the denominators, you just keep it. If it's been identified as a common denominator, sine squared would be the common denominator. And then you would have this, the sine squared of theta plus the cosine squared of theta on top. The sine squared of theta plus the cosine squared of theta on top would produce one, according to Pythagorean identity, which means that this would be one sitting on top of sine squared of theta. And then we would be basically where we were before. Where you have this, sine squared of theta basically above the line, sitting adjacent to this sine squared of theta sitting below this line. Top times top, bottom times bottom is the same result. Something ugly, even divided by itself, as long as it's not zero, is one. There's more than one way to get the answer. That's the only point of mentioning it. So even if you start out with something complicated, do not feel bad, just stick it through as far as you can go. Right? And be open to the possibility. Maybe there is a better way of doing it. There was. The first one was better. But you never know until you try. Okay? Right. That is, as they say, that. So let me stop here. All right? as, I, as I mentioned before, try to print this. All right? It will be available to you. All right? um, use this as your roadmap. Right? These are the things that you could change whatever is given to you into. Okay? Right. I'm going to take a look at um, section 9.1 in my open math, and uh, I'll tell you which problems to do. Okay? All right. I'll see you on Tuesday. We'll do equations um, on Tuesday for section 9.5. All right. See you later.